Hi, I'm uh, Eric uh, Jonsmas, and I'm here to introduce our distinguished speaker for today, uh, Professor William Rock. Uh, and um, I, I intersected with, uh, and you can see his title here, I intersected with Bill in the Yale, uh, Yale Computer Science Department very early on when we were both finding out what we were going to do in our careers, but already Bill was uh, charging hard ahead on uh, <laughs> scientific computing, all the math that's required for that, and uh, parallel uh, implementations of scientific computing, um, which uh, he later had... Uh, uh, became actually a, a real contributor to the, to the community. Uh, he moved to Argonne National Labs and contributed to the uh, very the, the, the most uh, widely adopted implementation of the message passing interface. Uh, and um, eventually uh, that was awarded the R&D uh, 100 award in 2005. Um, <clears throat> then he did it again. Uh, and contributed to the, uh, took a leading role in the um, <clears throat> portable extens extensible toolkit for scientific computing, Petsy to its friends, uh, <clears throat> and uh, again another R&D 100 uh, award in 2009, um, captured a few uh, named uh, awards uh, that I, I do remember, but I'm gonna uh, <laughs> skip over them, <clears throat> and is currently the, uh, Thomas Siebel, uh, <coughs> Chair in Computer Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, also famed in parallel computing, and the National uh, <coughs> uh, Center for Supercomputer uh, Applications, where he's the, the Director and Chief Scientist. Um, I have to wind up by <coughs> mentioning uh, career highlights that you just can't leave out, unfortunately. Uh, fellow of the uh, Association for Computing Machinery, the IEEE, um, and uh, the, the uh, uh, Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, I am, so it's not just computing, but um, applied math as well, and has been elected to the National Academy of Engineering. So please uh, join me in welcoming Bill Groff uh, to take this evening's lecture. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to wander around here. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, it's a lot warmer than back in um, Urbana, so it's been really nice to be able to sit out and um, have coffee for breakfast. Um, what I wanted to talk about today are some of the challenges in programming extreme scale systems. And the message that I want to give you is that I think that the challenges are both not where you might think I'm going to take this, um, and that those challenges are the same challenges that we face uh, for almost any other type of computing. Uh, but first, maybe to sort of set the scale for the kinds of things we're looking at for the extreme scale machines. Uh, here are some examples of uh, architectures that we've been looking at for extreme scale systems. Uh, so you know, this is the processors for the Sunway Taihu Light, which until recently was the, um, the fastest machine according to one particular benchmark, the high performance low tech benchmark. Um, I should say that uh, it's an interesting benchmark in the sense that when it was originally used, there were significant applications for whom that benchmark was relevant. This is no longer true, but we still use the same benchmark. Um, another uh, an interesting thing about this is it's a very heterogeneous system with um, uh, processors that uh, derive from uh, digital signal processors and in fact have no data cache. They have a fast scratch pad memory, but no data cache. So this is not a system that is designed to be programmed by your you know, average random programmer. It's designed to be programmed by people who are trying to get particular things done with it. Um, another example, uh, this was a, an abstract model that was done by uh, some of the Department of Energy um, the, in fact, the weapons labs, in terms of what they were looking at as what the machine would be. And again, you see that there are these, uh, it's very heterogeneous. You've got what they call here these thin cores, or maybe they're accelerators. You've got fat cores, uh, which is a synonym for uh, a conventional um, processor architecture, probably an x86 or a, a power PC, and then different kinds of memory. Uh, 
I put this one in because it's a reminder that it is possible to build, design, and deploy an interesting architecture in uh, less than a, a couple of years. We'll do this in two. This, this architecture, by the way, this was done in two years from conception to deployment. Right? So when somebody says you can't do it in seven, they say, I can't, they can't do it in seven. Other people can. Um, this is an interesting, um, again, I, I personally um, wouldn't want to ask somebody to program this. It's a very simple-minded system, um, but it has a thousand processors and a very, very high power efficiency, about 70 gigaflops per watt. Uh, an earlier version of this machine just is another example of why you need to take what you might have heard about the uh, costs of um, developing architecture to a grain of salt. An earlier version of this machine was funded with a Kickstarter, and you can buy the machine on Amazon. Okay. Um, there are drawbacks, no, no free lunch. And then this most recent system here, these are the machines um, that are now on the top of that list with that benchmark. Uh, they use uh, two power nine processors, um, the version called Sierra, which is the one here in California, Lawrence Livermore, has four NVIDIA Voltas. There's a machine at Oak Ridge, which has six, but it's an example of the trade-off. Um, these, these processors have these six memory paths, and the one in the Summit also has six memory paths, which means they, have a, uh, uh, they only have two paths to each of the Voltas, so you take a 33% uh, reduction in the ability to move data in and out of the processor. And so, one of the reasons why this big benchmark that everybody uses is so, um, has, has lost so much relevance is for a lot of the applications, and this is true for science applications and it's true for many other applications, is much more dependent on your ability to move data around than to just do plots. So, okay, so that's sort of the background. Uh, the applications are running on these systems also are uh, quite demanding and they're quite varied. And so we have sort of the usual suspects of combination fluid dynamics, virtual mechanics, molecular dynamics. This is quantum chromodynamics. This is, uh, is the standard model of physics. Um, it tends to use a lot of, of uh, computing power. It's another interesting place where the error bars on the experiments are much tighter than the error bars on the theory. <laughs> Not clear what our experiments are telling us yet, um, but you know there are other things: image processing, advanced urban simulations, graph analytics, a whole bunch of stuff there. In addition, and so and this is also important. It's in addition, not um, in uh, in exchange of. Um, there's a rising um, importance of uh, machine learning, and I will get on my soapbox and say imitation intelligence um, instead of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence to me means intelligence by artificial means. That's not what machine learning gives you. What machine le learning gives you is the appearance of intelligence without understanding behind it. Now, that's not a bad thing. And I didn't say well, and then as a result this is uninteresting. I'm saying that it's a different thing and it's important to understand that difference. And so. Um, it's, been, it's incredibly powerful and useful. Those tools are transforming how we do almost everything. Um, but it's doing it by imitating intelligence, not by um, providing another route to intelligence. Um, and these methods require um, a lot of computing. An interesting uh, press release came out of, I think, Baidu, maybe not two years ago, where they said, well, we have this real problem in doing our machine learning. And surprise, the HPC people actually have, new, have good algorithms for doing this. So they weren't focusing so much on, you know, we have a, a library or a, a piece of code, but the algorithms uh, that address that. So there's a lot of overlap in what has been going on in high-performance computing, what applies at these extreme scales, um, and what we see in the rise of um, machine learning of various types. And in reality, a lot of systems are built up of all of the above. So one example I'll give, uh, if you're trying to identify gravitational waves, the signal is incredibly noisy and 
the gravitational wave uh, is very hard to, to see in that signal. Um, but the gravitational wave has a tremendous amount of structure, which gives you a handle for it. So a, a, a group um, that works for me used a, uh, a toolkit which allows you to solve Einstein's equations to see what um, these gravitational waves uh, would look like from the sort of cataclysmic events that, gen that produce enough energy to be observed by the existing gravitational wave detectors. You can then use those to train a machine learning system. So why do you need to do that? Well, currently we have four observations. It's hard to train a machine learning system on four observations. So sort of go forward to use simulation to create the data. Use that to train a system that is now um, much better at extracting the information out of the gravitational waves than the approaches that they've been using in the past. So the message I'm going to give you here is that if we're looking at these extreme scale systems, in some sense, the part that you may have thought that I was going to concentrate on is the easy part. Um, and that is the internode communication. So I should say that these systems currently range from uh, about 4,500 nodes to um, our, our system, Blue Waters, is probably one of the largest with about 26,000 nodes. So each node having um, 30 to 100 cores. But the number of nodes, so for the internode communication part, um, is in the thousands. Okay, so there's so it's a non-trivial problem, but it's not in fact a, 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 a problem that is insoluble. Okay. So uh, people often say, well, um, we have exascale, you're going to have a million or a billion processes. How do you deal with that? Well, it's because either it's not hard. If I have a large complex three-dimensional physics simulation, I can find more than that much um, parallelism. In fact, my biggest problem is I have way more parallelism available than that. Um, or um, there isn't enough independent parallelism, in which case it's actually impossible. <laughs> That's not so bad. An, an impossible problem is an impossible problem. So stick to the ones that aren't hard. Um, so the, the challenge in these systems, in fact, is often in defining the the, the data, the operations, and managing the decomposition of the data across the machine. So how do you spread that data structure across 4,500 nodes or 22,000 nodes? There are a number of solutions for this. The dominant one um, is the message passing interface, at least in um, technical computing. I will say also that if you look into some other areas, uh, you'll often find it. There is a nice paper, I think it was about three years ago, ago that looked at some graph analytics frameworks. They were comparing their performance to them, and they had a thing called native. About halfway through the paper, you discovered that native was, we wrote this in MPI, and compared the graph frameworks to that version. The graph frameworks tended to be between 10 and 1,000 times slower. Um, now again, um, the graph frameworks were also more flexible, so it wasn't one has to be careful how to interpret that. But that was the, um, the performance flexibility trade-off. So and you should ask, how many people even know what had heard of uh, MPI before today? Okay. Well, it's actually not too bad. <laughs> um, an important thing is that, uh, so MPI is over 25 years old. Uh, uh, defined um, in the early 90s. It's been used actively um, ever since. It continues to dominate in the large scale. Um, I prefer to call it a system because it's more than, uh, it implements more than one programming model. Uh, there is a tendency to be sloppy about that. Um, so uh, it does implement message passing, which is a programming model, but it also includes one-sided communication, which is a different programming model. Um, depending on how one thinks about it, um, there are collective routines, so you can define arbitrary collections of processes, and then there is a collection of routines both for data motion and data computation across those. In fact, one of those 
is the operation that Baidu was referring to when they said, gee, this HPC people um, have solved this problem uh, that we have for this uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, algorithm. Um, there's a parts in the newest uh, version of MPI, MPI3, that provide portable access to shared memory on nodes. Um, so this is an alternative to threads. Uh, one of the reasons that that's important is one of the strengths and weaknesses of MPI. So a lot of people will tell you how hard it is to program with MPI. Uh, I don't think it's really necessarily that hard, but I won't n disagree with them. Um, the issue, though, is that the reason that MPI, some people view it as hard to program, is the reason it's been successful. So what MPI makes you do is think about your data locality and manage your data locality. It turns out that that's critical for performance, and nobody in their right mind um, is programming a parallel computer for fun. <laughs> we're, we're programming them because, you know, some of us aren't in our right minds, but <laughs> computational scientists in particular are using parallel computers because they have to because they can't get enough performance in any other way. And so a programming system that doesn't help them get performance is irrelevant. And MPI, by forcing the programmer to focus on data locality and to manage that, has meant that the programmer had to focus on performance, which meant they had to focus on what they were doing the parallel um, programming for in the first place. Um, and so um, that's been an important uh, part of MPI. Also has a, uh, actually has a very nice MPI, uh, a, a nice IO model, which unfortunately has been somewhat uh, limited by uh, POSIX semantics, and I'm gonna say a little bit more about that later. Um, and it's also designed to support port firming in the large, so it has a lot of support for building libraries, and that was another um, key to its success, and it's something that uh, is, has been missing from a lot of other uh, programming systems for parallel, sy for parallel programming, to tended to focus on uh, being able to write um, sort of monolithic codes that are then used as an application, as opposed to writing tools that can be um, put together. Um, and people have looked at the issues of scaling this to large exascale systems. Um, so there are already MPI implementations that support more than one million processes. Um, a lot of systems um, that are running with over a half a million uh, independent cores. Um, and it looks like uh, exascale systems will be no larger in terms of nodes than the systems we have today. So if you look at, at the uh, most likely um, winners of the exascale race, uh, they're going to have somewhere between five and 20,000 nodes. Uh, now, this is not to say that there aren't challenges. I've listed a bunch of them here, so if you know MPI, I hope you found the, uh, the one you're worried about up here. Otherwise, uh, just you know, we know that there are problems. Um, and in particular, MPI is a standard. Um, most of the things that we're familiar with are um, implementations that are documented. There's a big difference between those. Uh, MPI is a standard, there's a specification. Um, no implementation is as good as it should be. And I'll uh, also give a few examples of that. But there are really no intractable problems. So there's no reason that we can't use um, MPI uh, at the exascale. Um, and MPI continues to evolve. There's a forum that meets. In fact, there will be um, assuming I get it out in time, a, a 4.0 draft at the annual supercomputing conference, which is in um, Dallas next month. And if you haven't been, uh, I encourage you to, to think about going and uh, see what it's like to be at a conference of 12,000 people who are all uh, uh, interested in getting the most out of their computers. Um, one of the criticism um, that's often raised about MPI, particularly in the context of exascale uh, processing is that MPI is a uh, bulk synchronous programming system, which is false. Um, but the, the important message here is not so much that uh, it's false, it's that the reason this comes up is because programmers like BSD systems. 
um, is a lot to say for them. Um, uh, they're easy to, to think about, they're easy to reason about, they're easy to think about performance. So it's important, in fact, for a system to provide these sorts of characteristics. MPI makes it easy to emulate a VSP system, at least um, modulo the performance model. Um, but even the original version of MPI from 25 years ago was more general and provides uh, the necessary support for building much more dynamic systems. Um, and so it, it has the pieces um, needed for um, exascale systems. So one example, uh, we'll move a little past the programming system. Uh, on these large scale machines, another concern has been whether the algorithms can scale. And that is a real concern. So for uh, scientific computing, uh, a lot of problems require, um, as, uh, as a step, the solution of a large system of linear equations. So even if you're solving, say, a large system of nonlinear equations or advancing the PDE, uh, at some point you may need to solve uh, a large system of linear equations. Large here might be uh, several billions to trillions of unknowns. Uh, and one of the best methods we have for doing this uh, are iterative methods based on uh, what are called Krylov methods. So you take your solution vector, your approximate solution vector, and you multiply it by a matrix that represents your problem. You may do what's called preconditioning, which is uh, include in that multiplication another matrix that approximates the, the inverse. Um, but a key part of this um, is taking a dot product of that vector across all the machines. And so that is a limiting step. Um, so questions are, does that mean that um, exascale systems won't be able to solve these problems? Well, it does make it a little harder, um, but there are things that you can do. So uh, algorithmically, we can look at that dot product, which is a synchronizing step in the algorithm, forces everybody to come to a screeching halt until you do that dot product. Well, it turns out you can reformulate the algorithm so that you can do some other work while that dot product is taking place. You can overlap the communication between all of the nodes and all of the cores uh, with other um, useful work. There are various trade-offs, um, but if you do this, you can, in fact, get um, some better performance. So here, um, an example, uh, this is um, speed up relative to the, the conventional formulation, um, and then the x-axis here is the number of cores. And so the important thing to note here is that these algorithms, uh, these reformulations, are, in fact, a little slower at small scale, but they rapidly become uh, significantly faster at the large scale. And so these algorithmic changes allow you to push the applicability of these systems up to uh, larger numbers of cores um, or nodes. Yes? Do you have any idea what makes the cyan and red curves non-monotonic at 120 pan? Um, no. Okay. There, it, um, the, the, um, part of this is the um, interaction of the algorithm with the expression of the hardware. And there's a couple of different things that can hit you in there. Um, so um, uh, that was, in, in fact, sort of the next part in, in my, my next sentence. <laughs> well, there's a perfect question. Um, is that in MPI, there are ways to express these operations, these um, non-blocking synchronizing operations. All reduce that allows me to write these algorithms um, and run them on the systems that we're um, expecting to see. Um, so let me look a little bit more at what it means to be running um, MPI on uh, one of these multi-core nodes. So MPI was designed in an era when a processor occupied more than one chip. And there was a there was a chip that did the integer stuff. And there was a chip that did the floating point. Uh, 
And so it was de designed around processes. Now, we knew at the time that threads were likely to be important. So part of the design is it's fairly thread safe, the sense that there is uh, no uh, sense of global state. There were other programming systems at the time that had the notion, for example, of the uh, current message, uh, which is uh, something that you just can't work with uh, in a multi-threaded environment. Um, so MDI started with a model with basically <coughs> single-threaded uh, processes. That's the way most people program them. Um, this is pretty, still pretty easy to think about. Most applications still look like this, uh, but there are issues. So to start with, um, architecturally, um, the memory for core um, tends to be declining um, as you add cores but not memory. Um, turns out that one of the things that you often do to make these MPI codes um, efficient is you stage memory so that data that you need from somebody else, you get and make a copy so that you don't have to get uh, each individual uh, word or byte whenever you're looking for it. Um, that means you have to have space for a copy. and so. Um, that starts to uh, be a problem as you get more and more cores, each you know, core running a separate process. Um, further, that model um, assumes that the, you know, there's a uniform communication cost model. Again, the reason we're doing parallel computing is to make things faster. It means that our designs, our algorithms have to uh, achieve that, which means we have to have some um, like I said, it's an execution model, some way we think about how the machine performs from a performance standpoint. Okay. So, um, uh, we typically, uh, people who design the uh, codes using MPI ever typically assume sort of uniform um, communication model, cost model. By that I mean that each process essentially pays the same uh, cost. I can think of them um, independently. Um, okay, so. Um, let's look at this a little more. There's a classic model, it's often called the postal model, that says that the cost of uh, moving data from one MPI process to another is, is modeled simply with a, um, we call it a startup term, so sort of a fixed overhead, and then there's a cost per byte. A very simple model, sometimes called an alpha-beta model, so alpha plus beta times the number of, of bytes. Um, let me look at uh, two examples of measuring the cost of moving data between processes on two different nodes. And what I'm using here, uh, there's uh, a benchmark often called ping pong. All it does is it sends a message to another node, and then that node sends it back. So ping pong. Um, and this is using between um, 1 and 16 uh, cores on each of these nodes. And it turns out these are two different machines, but they both, um, depending on how you want to look at them, have uh, 16 cores in each. Um, and this is the bandwidth per process. So in the model that the performance of the communication is independent, and it's the same for all the processes, there should be one line. And so there is one line up here. There's a little glitch here. This one I can't explain. <laughs> um, but then there's this big fan out here, and this is a log chart, so this is an order of magnitude here. So what's happening? Um, so our simple model, and I prefer to write it with the sort of startup plus rate, first rate. Um, so what's going on? Well, if we look at what the node looks like, we have all these processes in the node, and they're sending data to a uh, network interface um, thing, which injects it into the network and comes back out of this network interface thing and goes back to the processes. This is a bottleneck. And it turns out that across a wide range of systems, there is insufficient bandwidth here to allow all of the processes to communicate at the same time. And so that means you need a different model, one like uh, this, where if I've got k concurrently communicating processes, then the time is going to be bounded by, essentially this is the max rate that I can get through here, 
is either the, the K of them communicating to the NIC or the rate which data can go from NIC to NIC. Now this is an approximation. It's a wonderful statement that all models are wrong. Some models are useful. This is definitely in the category of the model is wrong but useful. And I will show you uh, an example of why it is useful. Um, note also that as this goes to infinity, you recover the original model, just as you'd expect. Okay. So yes, it is um, approximate, but if I use this model, um, I really should put this up here without the labels and then ask you to guess. <laughs> right. So it's not perfect. Uh, there are a few differences, you know, particularly out here, but it really is um, quite close. Um, you can look at the error. Um, it gives you a much better model um, for looking at this. So why do I care? Because it can help me devise better algorithms. So um, another thing that MPI has are things called process topologies. It allows you to describe how your application is going to communicate, how the processes are going to communicate, and then you can ask the programming system to place the processes in such a way that the communication will be more efficient. Um, again, this has been in, in MPI from the very beginning. Um, there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, research that has been done creating algorithms that uh, promise to give you good mappings. Um, in reality, uh, that work is almost never applied. And so while um, if you write a code using the virtual process topologies in MPI, the code will run, it will run correctly. Um, if you ask MPI to reorder the processes to make the communication more efficient, with a few exceptions, the, the major exceptions were the um, NEC SX series of machines, um, particularly due to the work of, of Jesper Trey, um, and the IBM uh, Blue Jeans, which had a nice um, uh, Cartesian mesh network, um, to most extent, you got no benefit. Uh, to most extent, the uh, real systems, the real networks, um, the real challenge of doing the mapping of the processes to the network was so hard that nobody did it. So it's an example of I can design a really great interface. I can point to the research that says I know how to implement this interface. That's not enough. <laughs> okay. um, so this is not used well. Um, let's now look um, though at what, what may be going on in an area where we can do something. So um, a typical reason to do this is hey, I, um, I'm trying to solve a partial individual equation on a domain. Um, I'm going to divide the domain up into little pieces, I'm going to put this piece of the domain on uh, the process I'm going to call process zero, and this, this piece of one. Because of the differential equation, they need to, some data from the immediate neighbors, so they have to communicate where those arrows are. Now, if I had four nodes, then this looks like a very nice, regular way to um, assign things, the amount of data that's moving between the nodes isn't, um, isn't bad, and in fact, um, it's uh, close to optimal. It, um, for the small number of processes, there's a couple other ways I could do this. Um, but if you look at what most systems do when they assign the processes to the nodes, um, there are two typical models. One is to assign the processes consecutively in a node until the node fills up and then go to the next node. And the other is to uh, assign them in a round robin fashion from one node to the next and then go back. Let's look at what it looks like when I assign them consecutively. Looks like this, so zero, one, two, three. But now the, um, uh, I'm still going to be using the communication that I have in this chart. So two has to talk to one, uh, three, and six. So two is talking to one, three, and six. 
This leads to a lot more communication between the nodes. And remember what we just saw, there isn't enough bandwidth between the nodes. And so by using this mapping of the processes to the nodes and then communicating, I put a burden on exactly the point in my hardware where I don't have enough um, excess capacity. So now that I'm thinking about it this way, I can say, well, you know, where's my bottleneck? Modern networks have a lot of bandwidth. They're really quite good. Um, the problem is getting into the network. So why don't I, instead of trying to solve a very hard problem, and depending on the network, you can get into the NP hard kind of problem of mapping the processes onto the interconnect network, why don't I ignore the interconnect network and simply look at how I need to map the processes onto the node. Um, so uh, it turns out in MPI, there's a new routine called MPI common split type. It makes it easy for me to find, and there's a little asterisk on it because it's not exactly the same as the nodes, but in practice it turns out to be the same. Um, so I can write a piece of code using an algorithm like this that uh, finds the nodes, um, creates a, um, two communicators, is a communicator in the MPI is a collection of processes. So one of those is a communicator for all the processes on the same node. Another one is a communicator that involves a leader from each of those nodes. Then I can form a two um, level decomposition so I can figure out how to de decompose my processes on the process, uh, or my uh, the labeling of the processes onto the processes I have on the node. I say three level because I can go another level. I can say, well, you know, if you go back and looked at that, the second slide, the first slide after the title slide, all of those uh, examples had more than one processor in the node. You know, in fact, uh, with the exception of the Adaptiva, they all had more than one chip on the node. So I can do a three level decomposition that takes into account the sockets or the chips on the node as well, because again, if you look at that, the biggest place where you have inadequate bandwidth is getting off the node. Number two is between the chips. So if I do that, I've looked at a number of systems. Um, here, for example, is a, uh, the Halo Exchange. So this is the, the copy of the data that's going to be needed by the neighboring processors. Um, this, is, um, uh, this is the bytes per second per process, so up is good. Uh, Solid lines are the system that took into account the, the nodes that, that executed the algorithm I just described. The dotted lines are what you get from the current implementations. And so you can see that in every case, uh, I get a, um, a significant improvement in the communication performance. And it's significant because um, the origin here is zero. So I didn't do the cheat of starting at some large number and stretching it. So um, this actually is nearly twice, uh, like 50, 60% faster than the, um, than the original model here. And this algorithm, um, the code is actually pretty short. And just taking advantage of re-examining you know, re where the performance bottlenecks are and taking advantage of that. Three dimensions. The same sort of story. Uh, the gaps are, uh, so uh, this performance advantage is not quite as, uh, as great. But again, um, pretty uniformly um, at very low cost. And in fact, for codes that were written to take advantage of the process topology at no cost, can make the communication uh, faster. Now, those are measurements on engineered systems. So that you know, that's useful information to tell you how they will prepare on, on those, uh, those codes. Um, this information tells you what the difference in the on and off node connections are. So this explains why you see that performance benefit. Um, now, I, you know, I ignored the network topology. Um, how important is it? Well, one of my students, um, in fact, uh, went to the effort of doing the mapping. So here we got runtime, uh, so up is bad. 
So here was the original um, as the message size got larger. Um, and again, this is a log um, chart. We go to the node aware, but ignoring the topology of the network, we get this blue line. If it goes to the effort to get the topology of the network, now if the process is to take advantage of that, um, he gets the red line. So again, it's a log chart, so this is more important than it looks, but by far the biggest benefit <coughs> comes from dealing with the difficulty of getting off the node. Okay. Um, so as I look at this, I'm, I'm now thinking, okay, so this has helped me look at the problems of dealing with the internode communication, thinking more about the consequence of having a node. Um, let me now look just at the node itself. So here, um, again, uh, most of the performance that we see comes from making really good use of the node. Uh, if we look at, um, for example, the, uh, the typical code that wins a prize like the Gordon Bell Prize for you know, computing at real scale, what you find is that the internode part was done carefully and well, but wasn't necessarily that hard. Where a lot of the effort has gone into is in getting the best performance out of the node. And so this is a place where it turns out the needs of extreme scale computing are the same as the needs for anybody who needs to get performance out of their system, even if they're on a single node. So let's look a little bit um, at where we are in being able to get performance um, out of an individual node. Uh, and we, we typically like to say, well, you should write clean code, um, and then the compiler will take care of that. How many of you who are teachers have said that? Right? That's okay. Yeah, so I'll leave it in a little bit, right? Um, sadly, <laughs> that's a dream. <laughs> um, it should be true. Um, we'd love to uh, make it true, but uh, this is an example that I've given in my class is I have them do this. This is so it's a transpose. It does no work at all, it just moves data around. Um, and you can, uh, this is from my laptop. So you get performance curves that look like, like this. Um, uh, and you, so uh, if it's small and it fits in cache, it's great. And as soon as it doesn't fit in cache, it really collapses. Um, there's a string benchmark, which for a lot of applications is much more reflective of the performance that you're likely to see. So if you need one number to look at your machine, um, I would normally pick stream instead of the floating point rates. Um, so and you can see that this is what, for this system, this is what um, stream would um, say. So you can do things like this. Now, why doesn't the compiler do this? Well, the compiler has an almost impossible task in front of it. Um, and so it could do this. Some of them will do something like this. But one of the challenges facing the compiler is when does it do this? Right? Uh, in particular, um, if I could go back, this is the wrong thing to do if your data size is over here. Right? So, but if you do do that, um, you can get um, a significant performance benefit Although it could be hard to figure out where it is. So here's, um, this is the performance. So again, up is good as uh, 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 related to different choices for the various um, strides. So these are different, uh, different tests, not different values. Um, I'll point out that um, if I tell the compiler, so give it uh, only three and a bunch of other options to really go to town, um, it's able to manage about 709 megabytes per second. Some of these, um, choices of the uh, uh, blockings got us up to over 1,800. So the reality is um, you, you see stuff like this. So here's an example from uh, Petsy. Um, this is from the, uh, this is a multiple dot uh, product, the sequential <coughs> version. So this is a core in a lot of the iterative algorithms. Um, and you see this, this code has been manually unrolled. And it's been unrolled by four, which is um, often, but not always, a good number. Um, for example, for the blue gene, it was not a good number because there's a five-stage pipeline, so five is a much better number than four. Um, this decision was made once, and, and it, was, uh, it was verified. The PETSI team is um, very careful to um, uh, verify that anytime they make the code more complicated, there's a benefit for it. But of course, 
That was true when it was done, which was um, before possibly some of you were born. Um, and it remains part of the code forevermore. Uh, that, that code probably is more than 20 years old. Um, and there are, um, there are things that it um, doesn't even address. So um, for, for some systems to get the best vectorization, you need to take care of alignment. Um, you need to um, uh, inform the system that you have taken care of the alignment. Um, so, um, so what do you want to do? So how do you handle these cases? How do you take advantage of the technologies that have been developed by uh, uh, the compiler researchers over the years, um, but marry it with enough additional information so that the compiler doesn't have to guess, for example, what is the data size? What is the layout? You know, is it a line? You know, um, I'm, I'm doing a transpose. Am I transposing four by four matrices or 4,000 by 4,000 matrices? Compiler doesn't know that. Um, it cannot make good decisions. And yes, there are techniques called code specialization, which kind of solve that. Um, but they also lead to code bloat, which has its own impacts, um, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, impacts on performance in the data sizes. Um, so what you'd li really like to do is sort of step back and think, well, what is it that I want? I want to write code that I can read. Um, if I'm a researcher, I want to write code that I can change. Um, and I want something else to be responsible for making that code fast. Right? Now, we used to call that some, something else a graduate student. Right? Um, that's really unfair to the graduate students because it's a real pain in the neck to do it. It's one of those things, like everything else, um, you should do it a little bit so that you really understand what it takes. But once you understand it, somebody else, you know, then it should be automated. So that's one of the things that we've been looking at is techniques to allow you to add enough information to code that systems can effectively um, automate it. So we're building a thing called the Illinois um, Coding Environment. What it does is provide um, a level of indirection sense in terms of invoking other tools that are built on compiler technologies to allow you to transform code. Um, uh, also apply auto-tuners. So another reason I mentioned the, <coughs> the transpose example is that um, I can create a family of transformations pretty easily, but understanding which parameters are the right parameters to use um, is something that changes from system to system. So they're not the same in each system, and so you need, also need tools to help with that. Um, so as an example, um, you know, one of the most studied examples for optimizing in uh, codes is matrix multiplication. Um, it's a very, you know, this is, is effectively four lines of code and then the closing braces to uh, express the operation. Um, but if you want it to run fast, you have to do all sorts of stuff to it. And so an example, what we did with ICE here is we say a little bit about what we want to do and then it spits out code like this, which you, you, nobody wants to write this code. And in fact, I wouldn't trust anybody to write this code because I wouldn't trust them to in fact get it right. So another one of these things that you, not only do you want automated, you need to insist on it. Um, and that gives you um, much better performance and the flexibility to invoke different tools and different ways of looks at it allows us, um, or you know, one of the things I want to do is I want to have a, uh, a competition between tools. And so here we've got something that's run, there's a thing called Pluto, which is a very good uh, tool, but we're able to do twice as fast as that. Right? And then, um, Partly because um, it was optim um, the, the set and order of transformations was sort of optimized for what we wanted to be doing, which is exactly what you're going to uh, expect to have happen. And, and in a real code, what you're going to find is that different tools are going to um, be the winners at different spots. So one needs to be able to put these things together. Um, I did also want to mention, just um, uh, because it's always overlooked, is that I.O. remains a big problem. Um, and particularly in high performance computing, uh, the community has been doing this for a long time. Um, we've uh, been doing you know, data science for decades, um, but in large extent, they've given up on the I.O. systems um, because they've been so bad, uh, they design around that. Um, but this is um, in part um, because there's a mismatch 
between the semantics of the I.O. system and the semantics of the applications. And to give you uh, two quick examples, um, the codes that we have been working with, uh, there's one code in, in uh, my center on uh, Excel uh, Center for Plasma Couple Combustion, and then this is a QCD code uh, that's used in the community. Um, th these numbers are in seconds. So for this code, the original time to read in a, the file to describe the domain was 4,500 seconds. Um, and that was okay, because they've run the thing for eight, nine hours. The fact that it took an hour and a half to read the data file in, you know, is only on, you know, 10, 15%, right? So it's not so, not so bad. When you're debugging and you're going to take a single time step, so you actually want to run for one second, it becomes some, somewhat of a problem. Well, it turns out that um, if you describe what you were doing and use the right semantics, um, you can do this in one second. And in fact, uh, this library that my student put together uh, did that. So that was a 4,500 fold speed up. <laughs> the same approach um, applied to Milk, uh, which also has a Cartesian uh, domain, um, gave us a 48 fold speed up. So uh, this code was better, but still pretty terrible. And I will say <coughs> that, that neither of us are happy with the one second. Um, we think you should be able to do um, better yet. So what are some of the problems? Um, POSIX IO has a very strong consistency model. Um, in, in, in fact, um, it's not implementable in this universe. It has a simultaneity problem. Um, it has lots of choke points. So again, look at, at, you know, look at where there are bottlenecks. Um, some people, how many people have heard of burst buffers? Okay, so for, for, for you, it won't fix the problem. <laughs> Um, uh, it won't fix the problem without changing the semantics. Uh, it's actually a really good thing, but it won't, but you have to change the semantics. What's interesting is in the big data space, they don't have these problems. And they don't have these problems because they thought about the semantics that the data system needs, and they've designed the data systems around those. Now, in some cases, they've been rediscovering stuff that we knew, but at least they have been moving forward on it. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, it, again, the, the thing to remember, and, and sometimes this comes up in talking with these scientists and say, oh, you can't take posits away from me because I'll have to change my code. The problem is not the, the interaction model, because I open a file, I read or write from a file, and then close it, and maybe a couple of other things. That's really the syntax. The problem are exceptionally strong semantics, which makes it very difficult um, to optimize. And what you find is that in the efforts to optimize the accesses, these file systems become fragile. So is there anybody here who runs a cluster that has a POSIX file system? Okay, if there was, they would be nodding their head. This is, this is, this is, this is the nightmare. And the, the reality is that there, there's, no, there's no need for this. The semantics, in fact, doesn't match what real applications do. I won't go through these, but um, if you start looking at, at what applications do, you discover that while it seemed like a good idea at the time, those are really poor semantics, okay? And so I'm going to close up by just sort of saying I've, I've gone through several levels of programming these large-scale systems. Um, as we start looking at where the really hard parts are, um, if you look at how, in fact, I've, I've said is here's a good way to, to program these systems. We'll use MPI for the internet <coughs> programming, so between the nodes. And then you can use whatever you want within the node. So, you know, that might be a threaded based system, it might be a, a different programming language, you could be running Python, whatever you want here. Um, and so, you know, pick, pick that. So what are the issues? Um, well, we could say that, that part of this is really great because it allows us to separate the concerns um, and solve the, you know, focus on the MPI problem part and the X part. Um, but the problem is the plus. The hard part in these is not to find the X, it's not the MPI part, it's how do the two work together? How do they um, uh, partition or share resources? So does MPI need a core to manage the data motion? Does the threaded programming system think that it also has exclusive use to that core? Um, what about the memory paths? Um, do each of those systems assume that they've got um, full access um, to those memory paths. So this is a place where work does need to be done, and this applies whether you've got two nodes 
or 20,000 nodes. Once you, you, once you're off node, you have to start thinking about how that partitioning happens. So, um, in summary, um, I think the most important thing here is that the challenges in exascale programming are really not just in scale. There are some there, but they're not just in scale. Um, it really has to do with how we put everything together, um, how we deal with um, these, in, in fact, increasing bottlenecks. So you can uh, you can look at the trends in being able to get data off the nodes, and um, it's a pretty scary trend when you look at it. Um, and so understanding how to put these programs together, to program in the large, uh, understand how the various pieces fit together uh, is the interesting and exciting part of building these uh, programming systems for the uh, extreme field machines. With that, I'll put up my thanks and take questions.